isn't it a bit odd that I'm sitting in Varanasi and talking to you still about Ukraine and what's happening around it. But that is that explains the state of the world because politics goes on. Politics in UP is very important and we will talk about that. We will write about that. But right now, all of our fates, all of the world's fate is tied to what's happening around Ukraine, between Ukraine, Russia, in that geostrategic area, and also in their relationship with the rest of the world and the impact. Fuel prices is something that affects everybody, but that's only one thing. Today, we have a U.S. official's testimony to the U.S. Congress saying that India has cancelled many aircraft, combat aircraft, helicopter and other other orders with the Russians. So what is happening right now is having impact on all of us. And that's why it's very important for, for us to understand the details of what's happening there tactically, strategically, geographically, historically and also geostrategically. So when you look at the geostrategic picture, there is something that we haven't focused on as, as yet. And that is the whole Black Sea area. Now, what is the Black Sea area? Now, Black Sea is the one area where, where Russians have some access to reasonably warm waters. It's also the big coastline that Ukraine has. It's also where the peninsula of Crimea is. It just it juts out into the Black Sea and sort of separates from Black Sea something called Sea of Azov. Sea of Azov also is a part of Black Sea, but the two are connected with a strait. Now, why is Black Sea so important geostrategically and what is happening? So for that, first of all, I would refer you to a statement that the Foreign Minister of Turkey has just made. Now, the Foreign Minister of Turkey, that is Mevlut Cavusoglu, I hope I pronounced the name reasonably right. Now, he has said that, look, the situation in Ukraine has transformed into war. Now, what is the meaning when the Foreign Minister of Turkey says the situation in Ukraine has transformed into war. Now, we know that Turkey is a member of NATO, but NATO is not actively participating in the war. And Turkey is in a very sensitive situation because Turkey is also a Black Sea country. It also has the post on Black Sea. Now, when Turkey says that situation in Ukraine is now a situation of war, he said the situation in Ukraine has transformed into war. Why is it? that the rest of the world immediately gets up and takes notice of that and says, oh, the Turks are saying that. That is because of something called in history, something called the Montreux Convention. Now, Montreux Convention was signed in 1936 with the overhang of the rising power of the Nazi. So a bunch of countries, important countries then got together. Mind you, US was not one of these countries. So a bunch of countries who were important and powerful at that time and who thought that they had maritime and strategic stakes in the region, they signed an agreement, a convention, a treaty, whatever you call it, in 1936 in Montreux, which is a Swiss city. And this was signed by Australia, Bulgaria, France, Greece, Japan, Romania, Yugoslavia, then one nation, one large nation. The US was not a part of it, but UK, USSR and Turkey also signed it. And this convention basically gave Turkey some special rights and responsibilities. Now to understand how those rights and responsibilities work and how Turkey now has such a power, such leverage over how fighting goes in Ukraine and what happens with the Russian operations there and why this comment about situation in Ukraine having become a war is significant. We have to understand the geostrategic location of two straits. Now, these straits are narrow passages that link one larger body of seawater with another. Now, Black Sea is not a small water body. Black Sea today generally is about little over 4,25,000 square kilometers. So, roughly you would say it is larger than the combined area of Rajasthan, which is India's largest state, and also Bihar. So, you have Rajasthan, throw in Bihar with that, Black Sea is a little bit bigger than that. Now, Black Sea itself looks landlocked. If you look at the map of the world from a distance or unless you enlarge it on a screen or you ask for a map only of 
that region it will look like it's a landlocked sea or it's a lake but it is not it looks like la landlocked you can see that many european countries share the coastline with black sea that is romania bulgaria georgia russia and ukraine and of course turkey now turkey is a member of nato but remember turkey is in a very unusual situation it is both a Euro european and an asian country although its territory that falls in Europe is just 3%. 3% territory, about 10% of the population is in Europe. It's still a member of NATO. So it's a country that straddles both Asia and Europe. Now, if Black Sea were to be landlocked, then how come shipping from Black Sea can come out and go to the global waters or shipping from oceans can come in? Shipping means civilian, merchant, military, everything can come in from the rest of the world and go into Black Sea. How does that happen? For that, you have to enlarge this map. And when you enlarge this map, or when you find a version of the map which is focused on this area, you will find that from the Black Sea, there is a very narrow channel that's leading into what is called the Sea of Marmara. Now, Sea of Marmara is also a large water body, much smaller than Black Sea, but still large enough to, to, to show up on a map, but it is connected by a very narrow channel with Black Sea. Now, it is on top of this channel that Turkey sits. In fact, if you are in Istanbul, you can sit on a waterside cafe and you can look at the other continent across this narrow strait. This narrow strait is called Bosporus. Bosporus at its narrowest is just 700 meters, 0.7 kilometers. That's like seven football fields. Right? So you can imagine how narrow it is, how congested it might be getting with all the shipping going into Black Sea and coming out of Black Sea. All of that has to use this channel. This channel, however, only takes you to the Sea of Marmara. Once again, if you look at, if you look at a small scale map of the world, it would look like that Sea of Marmara also is a landlocked water body, but it isn't. So enlarge it again and you will see that connecting the Sea of Marmara with the international global ocean network is another narrow channel. That narrow channel is called Dardanelles. Dardanelles at its narrowest is 1.2 kilometers. So, okay, that is not quite as narrow as the Sea of Bosporus, but it is still narrow enough, 1.2 kilometers. And this also is controlled fully by the Turks. Now, the Turks to that extent could have total control or over access in and out of Black Sea. Now, in 1936, this, this treaty was signed, the Montreux Convention, which laid down regulations and rules whereby shipping would be allowed freedom of access through these channels. Because what are these channels? Both these channels are like slightly wider Suez canals. And if a country wants, they can block these channels as Suez Canal has been blocked in the past by the leading nation there, that is Egypt. Now, you didn't want something like this happening here because too many countries' interests are involved. So, even before the Second World War started, this convention was signed. So, this convention gives Turkey some responsibilities and powers. Now, responsibility is that everybody, all shipping has freedom of access through these channels to Black Sea and out of it. That is like the global law of the sea. But remember, the United Nations Convention on, on Laws of the Seas, UNCLOS, that doesn't apply here because that convention says that any conventions or treaties that existed before UNCLOS came in, they will take precedence. So, treaty or convention of Montreux came much before UNCLOS. So, that law applies here, that treaty applies here. Under this treaty, under Montreux Convention, Turkey, number one, it can close the channels to ships of belligerent partners in case a war breaks out. So, if two countries are fighting a war, it has then power to control access to those ships. It can close it to them. But remember, very importantly, it cannot close it, close access to those ships who are going back to base. So Russian ships, which are based on its Black Sea ports, they have the right to come back. Even if they are currently floating in the Mediterranean, they have the right to come back, even if a war is going on. Similarly, Ukrainian ships would have that right, but the fact is Ukraine is hardly left with the Navy. In 2014, when the Russians took Crimea, they also took the home base of Ukrainian Navy, which was Sevastopol. They took away Ukrainian Navy ships, they took away their dockyard, 
they even took away those personnel from Ukrainian Navy who were willing to fight for the Russians. So Ukraine really doesn't have a Navy right now. So the only power that is affected is Russia. They could be affected by way of Turkey ordering, stopping or regulating or slowing of their military shipping going through these channels or by using selectively its powers to allow other non-Black Sea powers to access these channels. So which are the countries sharing the coastline of Black Sea? That is Turkey, number one, Romania, Bulgaria. Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria are all members of NATO already. That's three out of six. Of the remaining three, Georgia and Ukraine are both aspiring members of, they both want to become members of NATO. And the sixth, Russia right now is attacking Ukraine. So it is in that region and Turkey holds the keys to these straits. Now, Russian Navy now has about 18 ships in the Mediterranean off the coast of Syria somewhere operating in that area. Do they want to bring them back? If they want to bring them back today, if Turkey says that this is war and I am I, and I am invoking my powers under the Montreux Convention, I can stop your naval assets from moving. They again cannot prevent those naval ships whose home base is in Black Sea. But the larger body of Russian Navy is not placed in Black Sea. They have to come in from elsewhere. If that is closed, and at the same time, Turks use again their powers and responsibilities to let, say, American and NATO military assets to go in and out, that is different. Now, all that is also governed by this unusual convention. It says that if you are not a Black Sea power, in the sense that, if you don't have a coastline on Black Sea, then you can still send your naval assets into Black Sea, but they cannot spend more than 21 days there. Again, if you are a Black Sea power, you have to give the Turks an eight day notice before a naval asset, a ship or submarine, etc. comes into this area. But you are, if you are a non, non Black Sea power, then you have to give a 15 day notice. So if Americans have to send a ship in, they have to give Turkey a 15 day notice. Again, the convention limits the size or the weight of the naval vessels. It was signed in 1936. Naval vessels used to be of a very different type. Now times have changed, but they limited the size then to about 15,000 tons. Today, an average frigate is about 3,000 tons. An average destroyer is about 10,000 tons. So both of them, regular frigates and regular destroyers these days, pass this test. But there are lots of ships which are heavier. Now, if you look at aircraft carriers, for example, in any case, aircraft carriers today are so big that can't, they can't even go through the Bosporus, which is only 700 meters. And there are restrictions on ships of that size and that weight as well. Now, Turkey's other powers in this treaty also include the fact that if they are at war, if another country is at war, at war with them, they can block all its shipping merchant or naval. So that's a special privilege that Turkey has. And then there are some other restrictions like at any given time, not more than nine naval ships can be going through these straits. Now, we have to remember as we understand the geostrategic implications of how complex this region is, if we need to understand the geostrategic and geotactical implications of how, how complex this Black Sea region is, Go to Crimea. Look at the map again. Russians took Crimea in 2014. Now, Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula juts out and it separates the Sea of Azov or what is called as the Sea of Azov from the larger body of Black Sea. But both of them are also connected with a strait. That is the Kersh Strait, K-E-R-C-H. So that becomes the third crucial strait there. Earlier, the Ukrainians controlled that. Now the Russians control that. Russian control, Russians control access to Sea of Azov. That's why they are able to get their assets in there. And they are now landing their marine forces or their naval infantry onto the coastline. And they are the ones who are now going towards Mariupol and try to take, trying to take over that time. They also took over the city of Kharshov and now moving towards the other larger port city of Odessa. In the process, now you find that while the Russians are coming in from other directions, that is from the Russian landmass, also from, from Belarus, they now have a third axis which is coming through the coastline. And that is because they control Crimea and the Kersh Strait. In this situation, for them to have access to the oceans so that 
their larger fleets can resupply their larger fleets can come in and if war really goes on they might want to use their larger vessels on the coastline or in the seas against ukraine in that situation these turkish powers could come in the way and that is why anybody would be worried about it now the question that arises immediately is has turkey ever used these powers turkey has used these powers only once during the second world war where it denied access to german and italian ships or axis ships because if they had gone in then they would have threatened Soviet Union's underbelly from the side of the Black Sea as well. So they've done it, but anything you've done once, you can do again. So, so read an article by Mark Newitt, which I will share with you, who's a naval law expert, he's a lawyer, who explains to us what this could lead to. And there are some, some recent references. 2008, for example, a particularly large American warship, that is USS Mount Whitney, the Turks allowed that. They didn't particularly press that 15,000 ton rule. They allowed that ship, it went into Black Sea, it came back. That was 2008. Then USS Porter, which is a guided missile destroyer, that's been going in and out. In the summer of 2021, the Americans also came in, US Navy also came in for exercises with the Ukrainians. That was called Sea Breeze 21, in which a ship called USS Ross had come in. And in fact, at one point of time, the Russian Navy in Crimea sent a warning to USS Ross saying that you are getting too close to us, stay away. So choosing discretion over recklessness or valor, USS Ross and the Ukrainian vessels, whatever was left of them, they stayed far away from the Crimean area. But even then, USS Ross was trailed by two or three Russian Navy ships all the time because Russians are very, very, very super sensitive about this area. So once again, in conclusion, Black Sea is a water body where a much larger power can bully its neighbor. In this case, Russia can bully, it could have bullied Georgia yesterday, it can bully Ukraine today, and tomorrow it can bully others, but all the others now are NATO members, so there is that limitation. The access to this water body is in the control of Turkey, which is also a NATO member. Turkey, on the other hand, is both bound and empowered by this 1936 convention called the Monthu Conventions. So these are things that we have to keep in mind and you will hear more about it if this war stretches. And I thought this is one area that we had not discussed or talked about very much. So things like this should not go out of sight, out of mind, which is the reason I decided to talk about this today while sitting in Varanasi watching the elections.